I'm never satisfied with, with what they do. I'm, I'm, a, I'm appreciative because they give 100%. But I always see something that can be improved. usher in a new era of marching bands, and 40 years after his arrival on the hill, evidence of his performance style and legacy plays on today through modern day band performances. Let me tell you, the, the band at Prairie View at that time when I got in the band, it was so small that when we would go to play certain schools, I remember one school in Louisiana, which shall re remain nameless, our band was so small that when we arrived and marched in the stadium, the fans at that particular particular school literally laughed at us. That we had the audacity is what they told us. That you could hear them from the crowd saying that they didn't believe that we had the nerve, you know, to show up. But we did. We had very proud band students, and we knew that our that our day was coming. Before he got here. Well, okay. see, see, and George and I came the same year. See, all right. I came about a month before he got here, so prior to us getting here, pri prior to my getting here, there were no scholarships, there was no financial support mm -hmm. for the band. And just as I said, we would go out with financial aid applications trying to recruit uh, students to come to be a part of the band. And so there was no, uh, no financial incentive, no awards, no stipends, whatever you would call it, for the band, all right? So uh, when we got here, I think there were four people in band camp, and uh, as the year prog progressed, we got to the first game, we may have had 40, 50, uh, 60, and eventually it grew up to as many as 96. George was uh, a one-of-a-kind individual. Uh, first of all, he was a perfectionist. He was a very angry man but he was a kind-hearted, angry man. When you first meet him, I mean, it's very, what's the word? It's very scary when you first, first meet him because you don't know him, it's intimidating. 
But then once you get to know him and you learn his musical genius, it's like this guy knows everything there is to know about music. And then he's a saxophonist and I play saxophone. So everything I thought I knew about saxophone, no. I mean, a mentor, you know, um, a father figure, a friend, I mean, everything that, that epitomizes a strong black man, he was that. George Edwards, who many former students and colleagues referred to Professor Edwards as simply Prof. Edwards, was born November 5, 1948 in Chattanooga, Tennessee. The youngest child of the family, little George Edwards, discovered his love for bands while in elementary school. Yeah, I remember when we were kids, we were watching a late night movie um, with John Philip Sousa. And uh, he made the remark that that's what I want to do. And I'm like, well, what? He says, I want to write music for marching bands. I like marching bands. And I'm like, OK, really? You know, because we were listening to those type of marches. The tenacious 17-year-old set his eyes and heart on the Florida panhandle and took his musical talent to Florida A&M University. He successfully auditioned and joined the FAMU Marching 100 and even penned compositions that the 100 still plays today. He didn't have a scholarship to uh, go to Florida uh, A&M, so he was moving on down there anyway, and he got in. He got in the band and everything. He got there, you know, he was working for prop, things like that, but he always loved music. From high school graduating there, he received a scholarship, but I don't know to what university, but his heart was set on the HBCU, which was FAMU, and mom said she couldn't afford to send him since he had already gotten money for this school. So he packed up, went down there, got into school, got a job, and he called back and said, I'm in. Yeah, I went to school at FAMU with him. You know, Lindsay, George, and myself were at FAMU at the same time. Of course, they were older than me. You know, I was a freshman uh, there, George's senior year, and Lindsay's sophomore year, so. George didn't like for me to say that. After graduation, Edwards headed to the Midwest to continue his education at Michigan State University, where the Spartans marching band performed and recorded many of his arrangements. George led a fulfilling life of teaching in Lansing, Michigan, and traveling for music performances until he received a call from a friend and former college bandmate, William McQueen. McQueen asked George to leave Michigan and to join him on the Prairie View A&M University band staff as the head arranger and to help rebuild an anemic program. Mr. Edwards came to Prairie View in 1978 and he was brought in as an assistant director under Bill McQueen, under Mr. Bill McQueen. And he was in charge of arranging the music, which meant that he and I had to collaborate a lot because the uh, Foxes danced for, at that time, just a minute and a half at the most. So we had to squeeze a lot of music into a minute and a half. So everything had to be really up-tempo, but it couldn't be so up-tempo that the girls couldn't get their extensions in for the high kicks that were part of our tradition. He was trying to work with the other staff, you know, to uh, make it bigger, you know. And I guess he must have succeeded because he became the uh, director of it. I decided to go to law school. And that decision to go to law school was made around uh, Around the final decision to, to go to law school was made around July, August. And so uh, I finally let, let the department head know that I was leaving. And, and of course, George uh, 
was in a position then to ask for scholarships and so forth, um, which he ultimately got. With a solid scholarship program in hand and rewards materializing from personal and financial sacrifices made, both men could see the music tide turning in favor of Prairie View's bands, performances, and sounds. Everybody was impressed with the band. So when Beyonce was going to uh, do the halftime for that Thanksgiving, I guess it was just a given for them that they would call Prairie View back, and we were really thrilled to get that call. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kelly, Michelle, and Beyonce, Destiny's Child. None of the other swag bands were doing drumline features, and it was new, it was refreshing, and this was years before the movie Drumline uh, uh, was, was even made. One of the colors in the swag. I mean, I'm like the, the best kept secret in Texas. So George W. Bush was our commencement speaker at graduation, and he said, I love your band so much that if I make it into the presidency, I want you guys to come and play in the parade and be my honor band. The honor band is the last band in the parade. And so as soon as he got elected, we got noticed that they wanted us to come to um, the inauguration parade. That's how that started. And listening to the best band in the land. I can assure some of the nervous folks, folks maybe nervous about what this speech is about, that I stand before you as your governor. However, however, if all goes well this November, I look forward to seeing the marching storm at my inaugural parade. Edwards navigated the band to a crescendo of success. But just like any good musical composition, the beat of success George Edwards and his beloved Marching Storm had been marching to would soon face a cadence of challenges. Prairie View had, ju had just been voted the best band in SWAC. And that title had previously belonged to Southern University. And I've always, growing up, been a great band of Southern's band. You know, their brass section, their Precision, I mean, great band. But Prairie View is a great band too. Southern's band had just performed a halftime show and it was Prairie View's time to come on the field. So we're lined up on the sidelines like we normally do. And Southern normally gets off the field and they make a right flank and they go. Well, their dancers were already in the stands and they came and broke through our ranks, which is disrespectful in the band world. You don't break anyone's ranks. So they broke straight through our ranks and their drum major at the time, he grabbed his mace and he swung at one of our flute players and then there was the side of the band with the majority of men. So our tuba players took up for our flute players at the time, and you just saw a horn fly, then you saw another horn fly, and uh, you saw people starting flying, and then there was just a swarm of people coming across the field. You know, we're on half, half the band is on one side, half the band is on the other side. The other side made it to the other side quick. You saw one drum major come out, and he was like, are we doing halftime? You know, you're in it, so you don't know what's going on. Then the drum major comes out, and then he runs back into the crowd, and it was just a mass mess. You saw instruments and uniform pieces flying, and then Prof. Elvis came down, and then you saw him clotheslining people, because he's trying to get his people off the field and trying to get his instruments, because we don't have that kind of money. We can't replace these instruments. You see people swinging saxophones like bats all kinds of things. And it finally calmed down and we all get back in the stands and we're trying to do a body count, an instrument count, see who need to go to the emergency room. It was a mess. One of our band girls was hitting the mouth, you know, with a, a trumpet, busted her face all open or whatever. We had a lot of bad injuries, you know, from that fight. And I remember just getting my girls and, run, and, and hurrying them out. Professor Edwards and the band had to heal from that blemish to his otherwise stellar reputation. But the masterful maestro got his student musicians on one accord. He was definitely funny. Now, he would go off, but he had this real passive side about him. 
he would go off with the students. He would go off on them, and then they would come in crying. He'd talk to them, and then he would talk to me behind closed doors. I really like that kid, but that kid needs to do this and that. But he would chastise them, but then he would let them sleep on his floor. That's the kind of person he was. He taught me just a whole lot of lessons in that, in that mind frame and really put, put it into perspective of, you know, um, you can be extremely talented at, at something, but if you don't have the work ethic and if you don't have the heart for it, you will always fail. George had told the students, as is always, was always his requirement, you know, that you dress, you know, professionally for a trip, you know. And this young man, there was a young man in the band who had dressed less than professionally and for this trip because we flew the kids out there. This was the first time a lot of students were flying or whatever. And um, so Mr. Edwards saw this young man and he, he was livid. He said, you know, he basically told him, what are you doing? Look at you, look at you. And he just really chewed him out and the little guy dropped his head, you know, didn't fuss back at Mr. Edwards or whatever. So when, when that exchange was over, some of the band guys came to Mr. Edwards and said, Mr. Edwards, you know, this guy, he doesn't have the money. He just, he didn't have anything to wear. And I don't know, it seemed like the kid had suffered some kind of financial hardship or maybe a death in the, in the family, whatever, I can't remember. George was so broken. He came by my room and asked me to come go with him across the street, the hotel we were staying in, there was a Galleria across the highway, across the street. And we went over there, and he went to the men's department and bought clothes for that young man. But uh, I was ready to graduate undergrad. And uh, I think I owed the university maybe like $987. And my grades were always good. And I was kind of, you know, down, practicing for my senior recital. He was like, well, what's wrong, money? I said, I can't pay for school, I'm not gonna graduate. And he was like, what you mean? I said, well, I still owe a balance. Got all my, all my, my credits, got this, got this taken care of. He was like, well, nah, you gotta graduate. He was like, well, let me call somebody. He called Ms. McDaid. I think at the time, they didn't have any more scholarship money. He was like, well, I can't have you just sitting around and went in his pocket, took the money out, walked up to the banks and paid the rest of my tuition. We, uh, we go to TSU, and this is the first, like, kind of battle of the bands that we had with TSU where we're performing with, it's just the band before the game. It's the day before the game. And I, to this day, we, you know, we kind of debate back and forth on actually, uh, if he actually said it. But I do remember somebody saying, it was like a little, little break in between the bands. It was a, a empty area. And I, I think I heard somebody say, hey, do not go in that area. So I said, hey man, you know, when this come up, don't go in this area right here, because they told TSU don't come over here. You know, we're gonna keep it, you know, down the middle, just do what we do and, and be cool. So soon as the song comes on, we looking at each other. Everybody look, we playing, we playing, but we're looking at each other. And all I see somebody do is point to the to that empty space. Like we're gonna point right there. Nobody said no, nobody stopped it. It was just once that that, that section hit, boom, we ran. I'm like, man. I've looked, he used to wear glasses, and he looked like over his glasses, <laughs> and he was like, I knew right then, like, okay, this would be my head, I know it. Walked up, he was like, go up there and tell them, I got him, I got him. You had no business going over there even near TSU. Why do you think we had that much room between us? Hey, you're stupid. Uh -uh. Let's go, go outside. <laughs> go outside, so we all go outside. He like, play the feature. I'm like, what you mean? He like, play the feature. I'm like, prof, our drums is on the bus. I don't care about the drums. Play the feature. I'm, I'm, not, I'm gonna punish you, but I'm not gonna punish you the way you think I'm gonna do it. I ain't gonna take his scholarship money. I ain't gonna make you do push up. You finna run the show. Run it. Edwards' keen attention to detail and preparation were vast beyond measures in having his vision for the band become a reality. I could hear him in his office and he would hear a tune or even if he didn't hear a tune, he'd just have his keyboard out and he'd just start playing. And then he'd write it down real quick. He'd be playing, he'd input it in the system real quick. And he'll make a copy and he'll come out with a score in matters of minutes. Like you could give him a napkin at a bar and he'll compose a whole piece. 
because he had a way of saying, you know, the entire nation was going to hear this and it has to be the right PB way. And I was walking um, across the campus and he called my name like, hey, Hollywood, come here. So I run over him, he said, hey, uh, give me the uh, 505 and the kid G. And I'm like, huh? Zero. You never know when you have a pop quiz. And I'm like, you playing, he's like, I'm for real. Those who affectionately call Professor Edwards, Prof. Edwards, knew deep down he was a warm-hearted musical genius. A musician who had inspired thousands. A lover of bands who grew up and dedicated his life to elevating the marching band performance and sound. The man whose impact on the marching storm still reigns to this day.